We're joined today by Kelly Hunt. She serves as Western Pennsylvania District Director for the U.S. Small Business Administration. Now, before we begin our discussion, can you explain for our viewers what the SBA does? Sure. Uh, the U.S. Small Business Administration is a federal agency that is designed to help small businesses in any stage of their life cycle. So we're the only federal agency with business in our name because it's really all that we do is helping small businesses. So we help them to start, grow, and expand businesses, you know, during normal times. But during disasters, whether it would be a natural disaster or as we have now with the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, we also help businesses to recover. And that's been our mission over the last four weeks is to really help small businesses in America to recover from uh, the, the economic downturn that we've had because of the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit more about that, about specifically what you do in that role to help those businesses stay afloat? Sure. Well, we um, provide one of the, the key components of what the SBA does is provide free one-on-one -on -one counseling to small businesses. And so we've been able to maintain that throughout this time, uh, especially through our resource partners, our small business development centers, score chapters, women's business centers. We've been able to provide that. Now, of course, that right now is not face-to-face, -face, but it is uh, still happening, you know, through the phone, the internet, um, and, you know, uh, different um, web application. So we are still doing that. But what we've really uh, been focusing on and what I think that most of the, the viewers would recognize the SBA for right now is uh, providing loans, uh, loan programs to help small businesses. Uh, we, we provide these loan programs throughout the year. So, you know, in typical times, we have various different loan um, programs to help small businesses to, you know, to start, to grow, scale up, whatever their needs would be. But during times of um, economic um, injury uh, or even during natural disasters, we have other loans that come into play. So uh, one of those has been the economic injury disaster loan. And so we've been um, working on that loan for the past a uh, few weeks, and then we also created a new loan program um, that came into play just a few weeks ago, and that was the Paycheck Protection Program. And so both of those loan programs have been designed to help the businesses that are being affected by the, the pandemic to, um, to make it through that time, to be able to pay their employees during that time, and to, uh, to be ready to reopen as soon as we're able to do so. How does the scope of need that you've seen during this pandemic compare to other responses you may have had during other disaster recovery efforts? Well, this has been uh, like nothing we've ever seen before. And I know that people say that and it sounds very cliche-ish, but it is true. I mean, when we've had natural disasters and we've had some really, you know, massive hurricanes, tornadoes that have impacted large parts of our country, um, but we have never had anything that our entire nation was um, was designated a disaster zone. And that is exactly what has happened with the, with the pandemic. So all 50 states and, and our territories have been um, declared uh, natural disaster or disaster areas because of the pandemic. And so that put a lot of pressure on a small agency like the SBA to uh, get loans uh, out to the, the, you know, the masses at, you know, at such a crucial time. Tell me a little bit about some of the feedback you've received from some of the businesses that are utilizing your services right now, what their experience is when they're applying for assistance and how long it takes them to, to get a response and so forth. Sure. Well, to give you an idea of, you know, what we've done in the past, uh, you know, few weeks, uh, in the last, if you just look at the last 14 days, the last two weeks, um, we have processed more loans in 14 days than we have in the past 14 years. So that shows you the level of, um, of impact that has been affecting our small business community. I mean, it has been, it, it's been difficult. Some days are really hard. You know, we're, my, my team and I were very passionate about helping small businesses. You know, my dad's a small business owner. My husband's a small business owner. You know, these are our family members too. And we're very uh, passionate about what we do. And to hear the stories that, you know, these businesses are going through, you know, 
on the verge of, of possibly losing everything because they can't make payroll and they can't pay uh, loan payments and they can't pay their rent and things like that it have been really difficult. And, you know, the, the good thing is that, you know, I, I know that, you know, these programs may be not designed to help everyone, but, you know, we have been able to get a lot of resources out there to the people that need it most. Just in Pennsylvania alone, we have done over 36,000 um, paycheck protection um, loans, 36,000, putting over $9 billion into the hands of small business owners in the state of Pennsylvania just in the last uh, two weeks. So you're talking about, you know, a lot of activity going on, trying to get the money out to the people, like I said, who need it the most. What advice would you give businesses who are trying to navigate this current situation, particularly if their business was closed due to mitigation efforts? Sure. Um, you know, really, it's it's where you have to be aware of, of what programs are out there. Unfortunately, anytime there's a, an incident like this, you know, we have a lot of fraud that comes into place, a lot of people who pretend to be the government there to help. And, uh, you know, and you have to really be mindful of that. You know, know that if you're looking at a program and it says Small Business Administration, we always will have a .gov email address. And that's really important. You know, you also have to make sure that, you know, you're watching the news, that you're staying on top of what options are out there and available. You know, uh, the two main loan programs that we've had, the EIDL loan, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the Paycheck Protection uh, Program loan, both of those loans uh, have depleted their funding. So we were given, you know, um, the, the funds to run both of those. We were able to do that for a period of time, but those funds have now all been depleted. So at this point, you know, we're waiting to see if Congress is going to pass another stimulus package. And if they do, will the, will the programs be the same? And then, you know, getting that money out there. So it's important to watch the news to, you know, a, a lot of the um, congressmen, the senators are doing tele-town halls where you can log on and, and hear, you know, your local, um, your state and federal representatives talking about programs that are available. It's important to be plugged into those to know uh, what you can, what, what's out there and what would benefit your business. How should businesses proceed if the funding, the financial assistance that they were seeking has been exhausted at this point? Well, we, we still do have some programs that are available. Uh, the SBA, if, if a small business has a current SBA loan, uh, we are doing a, um, a loan forgiveness for a period of six months where you do not have to pay the principal or the interest on that loan for six months. The SBA is actually picking up that payment for small business owners. So it's not only that you're not having to pay it, but your balance is being paid down during those six months. And that's an amazing opportunity for people that have a current SBA loan. Also, our, our, like I had mentioned, we have many loan programs out there. And with those loan programs are still working. You can get a hold of your local lender and talk to them about options for borrowing money. And if you were to borrow money during this time, during this pandemic, you would still get to get that six months without a payment on a, on a new loan, so new or existing loan. So that's a great program that we have out there now. Uh, the IRS has some tax credit uh, benefits that are out there. You can look at that at irs.gov, you know, the state of Pennsylvania, and even sometimes, you know, local, um, you know, governments, counties, different things. Look and see what you can find um, on those sites to see if there's any other programs out there that are, you know, not at the federal level, but maybe on a state or local level that could help. Looking ahead, once restrictions are lifted, what kind of involvement will the SBA have in helping these businesses to really get back on their feet and attract customers once again? Uh, you know, and that's that's again where where we really step in with that counseling. You know, businesses weren't really prepared for this. I mean, this was something that, you know, we, we talk about contingency planning and making sure that we're prepared for things that could happen and impact our businesses, but no one thought that we would be in a situation where 
where we were in a place where businesses would close down for so long. And so the SBA is always here to help with that counseling piece. And uh, I had mentioned our resource partners. They are a vital source of help for small businesses. Free one-on-one -on -one counseling, you know, you can come and talk to people. We, you know, we're doing over the phone. We're doing um, internet counseling. All of our resource partners have all kind of different things available for helping the businesses. We have a lot of webinars that have been recorded over the last few weeks that are available to to watch. And so you can, you know, reach out to my office. Reach out to your local small business development center. If you go to sba.gov sba.gov and you click on the local um, assistance tab, you can find all of the assistance that is available in your local area uh, to get hooked into these counseling and, and training classes. Kelly Hunt serves as Western Pennsylvania District Director for the Small Business Administration. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. PCN is committed to providing the people of Pennsylvania with the most up-to-the-minute information about coronavirus daily special programming with civic, business, and government leaders and how COVID-19 is affecting the community. Airing weekdays at noon and 8 p.m. Live special coverage of the governor and the Secretary of Health, as well as programming designed to inform and assist everyone impacted. Go to PCNTV.com for the latest information. I'm joined by State Representative Matt Bradford, Democratic Chair of the House Appropriations Committee, Last week, uh, the House and Senate had passed a bill that would encourage uh, and expedite the opening of Pennsylvania businesses once again. All House Democrats voted against the bill. Why? You know what? I think there's been a needless politicization of the whole process. Uh, a lot of us obviously realize that governors and really across our country have been put in a very difficult spot, uh, but they're doing the best they can and they're using uh, the best minds out there. Uh, so whether it's Dr. Fauci or our Surgeon General at the federal level, uh, Dr. Levine at the state level. I think this is a process that needs to be driven by medical science and data, uh, not by politicians and a political process that I think does uh, a disservice to our constituents. How do you respond to the argument that under the current order, big box stores have been allowed to remain open while smaller private businesses have been closed? You know, I'd be the first to recognize this is a time of unbelievable pain for so many small businesses. I worked uh, in my own parents' small business. Um, but we need to be work worried about the workers. We need to be worried about the community and public safety. Is there inequities in the situation? Absolutely. Are there things that could be done better? Uh, absolutely. But at the end of the day, the idea of wholesale reopening the economy uh, in counties that are frankly uh, continue continuing to see the uh, steep increase in the curve is just as, as one labor leader called it lunacy. What would you like to see accomplished or put into place before businesses do begin to open? Well, you know what? It's not so much what I want. I think that's the whole problem. It's not what politicians want. If it was about what politicians want, we'd want this never to happen, right? Democrat, Republican. Uh, there's no difference in that. What, what I think we should do, though, is heed the call of our medical professionals, our public health officials. And they're saying we need increased testing. Uh, we need to do this carefully and cautiously and driven by the data. Again, I don't want to open one day too late and I don't want to open one day too soon. Uh, but if we're going to err, let's err on the side of medical science and not on, on frankly, the, uh, the gut feeling of one politician. I just think uh, a partisan process right now is, is doing a real disservice to our uh, Commonwealth. What more can be done to help Pennsylvania families who may be out of work at this time? I think there's a lot. Uh, so one thing that House Democrats, our caucus is pushing on, is making sure that instead of second guessing the governor or trying to, uh, to overrule the governor, let's assist the governor in getting our workers the PPE they need. Let's get our workers the hazard pay they deserve. Uh, let's work on helping our small businesses by recapitalizing the capital assistance program to give small uh, loans and grants to these businesses. There are things that this legislature should be doing on the side of small business, on the side of workers, on the side of communities, uh, rather than the political process that unfortunately uh, the legislative leaders have seemed to have gone down that process. As of Sunday, both customers and employees are now going to be required to wear masks when entering a place of business. What more would you like to see put into place to help protect workers that are on the front lines? Yeah, I think there's a, uh, th there are real heroes in this, right? Uh, one of the things that came out of 9-11 was a recognition that it was really police and fire 
um, that we're going to be on the front lines in that war. Well, we're in a very different war now. And against this virus, in many cases, it, it's our healthcare workers, uh, it's the grocery store clerks, uh, it's the folks that are, are truly doing some of the hardest jobs in society long before the pandemic at the, at the lowest wages. So I want to see them, one, get the respect they deserve, but two, and, and just as meaningfully, these are folks that are working round the clock in many cases to keep supply lines open. We should make sure that we're helping them with childcare, PPE, uh, minimum wage. These are things that we should have done, frankly, before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has exposed the inequities that are across our society and shown that those that we rely on the most who are truly essential are in some cases our lowest paid workers. We need to give them the respect and the protection they deserve. The Senate last week passed a bill that would create a task force that involves lawmakers in the governor's disaster response plan. What do you think of this bill? You know, again, uh, I really think that there's not a Democrat or Republican response to that. That proposal, as it was, was largely driven by legislative leaders with members of their own party. Uh, party doesn't matter in this. Uh, what I want to see is, is, frankly, business leaders, labor leaders, government officials, not in a bipartisan way, but in a nonpartisan way, that goes about looking at how we can open business uh, in a way that is pragmatic, and protective of workers and communities. I'm from Southeastern Pennsylvania. We've seen firsthand the devastation that COVID without mitigation can bring. And we recognize, I think more than most, uh, that we don't want to see that on any other community. So we should do this in a thoughtful way. Again, putting the politics aside. There's no place in this battle that we're in for the politics that we're seeing as part of this. We can shift gears as the Democratic Chair of the House Appropriations Committee. What are your expectations on how the budget process will, will play out this year? Obviously, it's going to be a budget like uh, none we've ever seen. Uh, in my short time in the legislature, I was actually there for the first end of the great, uh, the front end of the Great Recession and how that looked. Uh, this is probably a, a hybrid of the impact of something like 9-11, uh, but with the long-term impacts of, of what we saw with the Great Recession. The governor's budget, as proposed, uh, has largely been overcame by subsequent events. Uh, we recognize we have an obligation, though, by June 30th to put the best budget in place as possible. Uh, there's conversations about a six-month budget using a shorter-term budget, getting us over the, uh, the, uh, the time of this closure. We recognize revenues have dropped precipitously at the time where demands on government, rightfully, have expanded. Uh, so the idea that we're going to, within our current uh, budget uh, system deal with this. Uh, the, the time for politics as usual, again, has largely passed. We're going to have to do some, uh, some tough work, but hopefully in a bipartisan way, recognizing that people are really hurting in Pennsylvania. Would you support program cuts or tax increases to balance this budget? I think anyone who says anything's off the table is doing a disservice to the Commonwealth, plain and simple. Uh, listen, no one right now uh, should think that the idea of raising taxes, or for that matter, cutting services is what this economy needs. It is way too fragile. Um, what we need to do is get our frontline workers, our hospitals, our health systems, our public health officials, our counties who are on the front lines, all the resources they need. On the back end of that, we're going to have to pick up the pieces, and that is going to mean everything's going to have to be on the table. Keeping that in mind, when the governor initially made his budget address in February, prior to the pandemic reaching Pennsylvania, he had called for some new initiatives such as the Nellie Bly Scholarship Fund. Are those types of things still under consideration right now? Uh, the reality is all of our priorities have to be reprioritized. Things that would have seemed like uh, have-to-haves or want-to-haves uh, three months ago now look like, oh, maybe next year. Uh, listen, I think the governor has some great ideas. I think the current budget has to be about putting support for our, our public health systems uh, and then our core functions of government. But again, if, if you're asking me, do, do I think it's a good idea to start you know, cutting support to education at a time where uh, local revenues are going down? I just think that's the wrong idea. Uh, I think at the time where people need more support from government, the idea that we're going to cut those programs uh, doesn't strike me as a good idea. So I think we've really got to come together. Frankly, Democrats and Republicans lock arms and say, hey, look, for the good of everyone, we've got to put aside old priorities and old political agendas and really move forward with an agenda that's really about the Commonwealth. Representative Matt Bradford, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Matt Francie. Join our guests for insights on issues impacting local government and the citizens of Pennsylvania. 
created by the Pennsylvania State Association of Boroughs, Inside Pennsylvania Boroughs connects you to legislation and policy that will affect you and your family. Your host, Chris Kapp, and his guests discuss current affairs that matter to you most. Connect with your state by tuning into Inside Pennsylvania Boroughs on Sundays here on PCN. We're joined by Senator Mike Regan. Last week, the Senate approved a bill to get Pennsylvania businesses back in operation. How do you envision this? Uh, what, which businesses do you envision this applying to first, and what kind of timeline do you see this playing out at? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the 613, I, I assume you're talking about, is uh, with the governor. Um, he's He's intimated that he would uh, veto the bill. However, he has not done so yet, which is curious to me because you would think that if it was automatic that it would have been done by now. Not sure what his plan is there. Um, but I mean, I think that probably initially you have to look at some of the some of the industry that has been able to continue in other states, um, like the automobile industry, the construction industry, perhaps uh, real estate. Those are three of the, the big ones. And I think probably you know, during this whole uh, COVID-19 experience is who we've heard from the most uh, along the way. One amendment to this bill allows county governments to to open those businesses incrementally. Why give this authority to counties? Well, I think because you have such a, 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 a big disparity in counties. I mean, you have some counties who have, you know, a couple of um, COVID-19 positive patients and some that have, you know, uh, an unbelievable amount. Like you go to Montgomery County, you know, in the Southeast and they have a whole lot more than, than Perry County has here in, uh, in, in central PA. And I don't think one size fits all in this particular case. And I think it's smart for the County commissioners. So within a County who, you know, will have intimate knowledge of how many hospitals are bed, uh, how, how many hospital beds are available in their County and all the information that is pertinent to that County can, I think can make a better decision as to whether or not uh, it's time and how to rule out a uh, return to work. I think that's important. In a press conference late last week, Governor Wolf hinted that he has his own plan to open up Pennsylvania incrementally. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean I'm glad that he's, you know, finally getting on board with that idea, but I think that it was short on details. Um, I think, you know, what, what we've been hearing, Francine, I got to tell you, we've, we've gotten thousands of phone calls from people that are in our district and, and, and are very frustrated and, and scared um, because their business, they see their phys- businesses falling apart. I think one of the things that's been consistent is they want some concrete plans like, OK, what, you know, first was with the waivers. Um, I'm not hearing back about my waiver or my waiver has been refused, but my competition's waiver has been granted. Uh, what do we do here? So I think the ambiguity of the entire thing has been one of the major problems. And I think consistent with that, the governor's plan lacks specifics on how we're going to roll out this return to work. Um, I think we need specifics um, so people can rest easy knowing that. Uh, and I can't, I can't say that um, with enough emphasis. People are very, very upset uh, about this. And you know, I can't blame them. I mean, it's, it's their family business. It's their um, way to feed their families. It's, uh, you know, it's important in so many ways. And they have been struggling um, a lot. And we're the ones, you know, us, us in the field, the senators and representatives and people across the state are receiving the phone calls about the desperation. And I think, um, you know, we would like to see a timetable time of May 1st, uh, but I'm not sure what the governor's plan is. What advice or response do you give to your constituents if they tell you that they have a business and they weren't able to get a waiver and perhaps some of the financial relief has now been exhausted already? Where do they go from there? Well, we've been trying desperately to put, uh, give them um, information about the federal programs that are available so they can get, uh, they can get relief. Um, you know, the, the PPP program, uh, we've been trying to put people onto that so they can they can receive relief for their businesses. Also, you know, through uh, un- unemployment compensation. Um, just recently, there has been uh, unemployment compensation for people who are self-employed. That's um, that's being rolled out. I think there's about a two-week, uh, at least a two-week wait till people can start getting uh, some reimbursement. So there are, you know, federal programs have been have been responsive and, and, and decent. The state programs are trying to keep up. I mean, we've had 1.5 million unemployment compensation. Uh, applications go in since this began. 
which as you can imagine is a nightmare for the, uh, the state workers who are trying to process all these. So they've been slow to, to, uh, to receive their paychecks. Um, but, um, you know, that's in place and that has been helpful to people. But, you know, I think, um, I think the fears, and, and this isn't just conjecture, this is what I'm hearing, is that, you know, they, their fear that this is going to be a generational effect on our economy, not just a temporary effect, which I think is very important. Tell us a little bit about legislation you're sponsoring um, that would protect police and other first responders who miss work due to the coronavirus. Yeah, Francine, you know that I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the, the men and women who wear the uniform. Uh, it is... Uh, so important to me that they are taken care of because they're out doing the job. You know, they're still out there, you know, doing the job of, of the police officer, which means hands on with people, um, you know, could be, uh, you know, so many things, um, you know, contact with the public and they do so without any complaints there. You know, we haven't heard a single complaint from uh, the law enforcement community. I mean, we hear from some of the chiefs who are concerned about um, their manpower because people are being quarantined and things like that. And they don't have enough men to do the job. So I thought it was very important that, uh, that we pass um, legislation that made sure that they are covered if they are, have been quarantined or they've had contact or they are testing positive. Um, that's Senate Bill 1106. And uh, um, it's getting ready to, uh, to pass. I think it's going to go to the governor. And, and uh, I'm uh, real happy about that. What do you think about the administration's recent move to allow the early release of some prisoners in, in hopes of avoiding the spread of the COVID-19 virus? That has been, uh, that topic has been uh, very disturbing uh, to me. Um, you know, most recently, I'll work backwards. So most recently, I've been hearing from uh, victims of crime uh, who are concerned about their offender being released from, from prison. Now, I think that the governor has been, uh, you know, as he presented it, has have said has said many times over that you know no violent offenders will be let go, and it'll be uh, you know uh, people who've had no long histories of, with violence in it and other things. But that message really isn't getting down to to the, to the people in our communities. And, and uh, so yesterday, uh, or maybe two days ago, um, I received something through, through Facebook from uh, from a young lady who had been uh, assaulted by a, a former boyfriend. And um, he had made threats to kill her. And, uh, you know, she sent me an impassioned plea over, over social media saying, I is he getting out? You know, I need to know. My family needs to know. Is this guy going to be one of the people released? Extremely stressed. So I, I sent that, I screenshot of that and sent that to the, uh, the Office of Victim Advocate in the state and said, look, this is, this is a very, very bad situation. We need to give up victims of crime as much attention as we're giving the committers of the crime, which I think hasn't happened. I, and I fault the governor for that. And, and, and let me just say one, one other thing. You know, I'm a former United States Marshal. I served for 23 years in the U.S. Marshal Service. And I have a lot of contacts within the law enforcement community. And I have not spoken to one member of law enforcement who thinks that's a good idea. They all agree that's a very, very bad idea. And if you talk about it as it relates to the disease, it doesn't make sense to me. It seems like, you know, if you want to contain people who may or may not have the COVID-19 disease, prison is the perfect place for them to be because they're, you know, in, being in a jail cell, they're isolated. Um, putting them out into the, into the, uh, you know, setting them free and putting them out in the communities, I think only causes more problems. So uh, struck a nerve. <laughs> I apologize, Francine, but that's something I'm very passionate about. I mean, I think it was a bad move. And you know what, quite frankly, I think it, it may have been a move by the governor to try to further his agenda to get more people out of jail, using the COVID-19 disease as a, as a mechanism to release more people from jail, I think is bad, 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 bad move. Back on an earlier subject, the governor last week announced that he was joining a coalition of other East Coast governors to work together on um, planning reopening of businesses. Do you have any concerns that the actions of other neighboring states may influence our state's decisions on how to proceed forward? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's it's necessary. I mean, I don't know why we we should in Pennsylvania should rely on what Andrew Cuomo has to say about what Pennsylvania should do. Um, and I, I, you know, one of the things that concerns me is you know the Republican governor from West Virginia, the Republican governor from Ohio was not consulted and it was not part of this group. I mean, it's a it's a group of Democratic governors. Um, you know, our state is made up of Republicans and Democrats. I think that uh, you know if there was going to be some sort of group decisions made. It should have been a bipartisan um, group. 
but unfortunately it was not. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, our legislature uh, w- would certainly be a group that the governor could consult with that has a, you know, a bipartisan structure. I don't think you need to look outward to other state, other states, governors who, uh, who have an opinion about what Pennsylvania should do. I mean, I don't want to get that. So uh, I disagree with it. Um, but on the other hand, I like the fact that at least we're talking about opening up. You know, it's funny, my, my, my daughter, uh, Brooke, who's 20 years, just turned 20 years old. She's a, a student at Pitt and she's a, a political science major. And she, you know, in a, in a very kind of obvious way said, you know, we're going to be dealing with this for a long, long time, this disease. What, what are we going to do? I mean, if this thing crops back up in, in fall, are we just going to shut everything down again? I mean, we have to find a way to, to operate in this state with the existence of this disease because it's not going to necessarily go away. We can't wait till there's no cases till we put people back to work. It would devastate our economy. We have to use a, you know, some common sense here and move forward with, you know, very strict uh, recommendations coming down from CISA and CDC, which makes it safe. It's got to be a safe way to do it, but we have got to begin to, to open up, open things up so people can get back to work. How has the spread of this pandemic affected or changed perhaps the legislative priorities in the Senate moving forward? Well, I think we are dealing primarily uh, with, with COVID-19 legislation right now. I think that might change in the next couple of weeks. I think we're, we're going to start pushing some bills out, which are um, stuff we've had on the agenda, which we think is very important. Uh, I think our leadership has done a very good job of prioritizing uh, bills. Um, so uh, I think, you know, we're going to be giving the governor some bills that are going to be strictly COVID-19 stuff, like my bill, hopefully, um, 1106. But uh, we'll see what happens. I think you're going to see some just general legislation coming out in the very uh, near future. Senator Mike Regan, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Francine. Thanks for having me. I hope your family as well during this uh, trying time. Thank you. During the uncertain times brought on by the coronavirus outbreak, PCN remains committed to the needs of Pennsylvania and its people. PCN provides free daily coronavirus updates from Governor Wolf and the Department of Health Secretary Dr. Levine, live, on air, and streaming on the app and online. These updates will be available to watch in their entirety on demand for free by downloading the PCN app or at PCNTV.com. PCN, committed to keeping Pennsylvania informed. I'm joined by U.S. Senator Pat Toomey. Senator, you've named on a task force uh, focused on reopening the economy. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of timeline you envision this happening and also perhaps what specific business sectors might uh, go in certain phases as well? Uh, Sure. You know, I don't think that this should be driven by an arbitrary timeline so much as specific progress that we're making, both in terms of reducing the incidence of, of this disease, but also in the ability of businesses and workers to keep themselves and each other safe. So for instance, uh, we've already seen, let, let's step back for a second and remind uh, ourselves of why we closed down our economy in the first place. The reason we closed the economy was to prevent a rapid spread of this virus that would cause uh, so many people to show up at our hospitals that our hospitals would be overrun and would not be able to treat the people that needed the treatment. Well, now here in mid-April, it's become obvious that that's not gonna happen in Pennsylvania. It's not not gonna happen in many places anywhere in the country, but importantly to me, in Pennsylvania, we have reached the peak. Our hospitals are not overwhelmed. In fact, we have many, many hospitals across big sections of the state that have very, very few COVID patients at all. Um, So since the, entire purpose for closing down the economy has passed, it's now time to begin the process of reopening our economy and allowing people to get back to work. I, I think we want to do it selectively. I want to think, I think we should do it in areas where we don't have very widespread outbreaks, where workers can stay safe by virtue of physical distance separation from their colleagues, maybe wearing masks, washing their hands frequently, you know, observing the basic Uh, measures that have helped slow down the spread of the virus, those measures will still work, but people can do them while they are working. And so I think it's time to begin this process of uh, allowing, allowing our society to become productive again. 
What should Pennsylvanians know about the $2 trillion CARES Act, the federal assistance package that was passed recently? Well, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, $2 trillion is a massive amount of money. And of course, uh, that's going to be supplemented by lending from the Federal Reserve so that in fact, it's going to be four or five trillion dollars, a staggering amount of money, something like 25 percent of our entire economy. And it's all meant to bridge this moment, this period of time when we've had to shut down the economy. So Pennsylvanians probably are well aware now that a lot of that legislation is designed to replace lost income for people who can't work for uh, you know, as a result of this uh, coronavirus. Uh, so there's a big increase in unemployment benefits. There's a big expansion in the number of people who are eligible for unemployment benefits, including people who historically have not been eligible. There are the direct payments, $1,200 per adult, another $500 for dependent children. A married couple would get $2,400, will get $2,400 plus 500 for every dependent child. Um, some of that money is already hitting people's accounts. Uh, in other cases, it'll take a, a few weeks longer to get the check in the mail, but that money is out the door. Uh, then, of course, there's the money being spent to fight this virus. Uh, $100 billion for our hospitals because they've, uh, they've experienced some real financial strains in this whole process. Billions of dollars in the development of medicines and vaccines, uh, personal protective equipment like masks and gowns and gloves. And then finally, there's the category of loans to businesses so that business can hopefully stay alive and people can have a job to go back to. In the case of smaller businesses, the loans, to the extent that they're used to pay for payroll, to keep their workers paid, those loans don't even have to be repaid. So it's really the federal government paying for the workforce to the extent that business can keep people employed. And for bigger business, uh, it's a loan program. It's money that has to be paid back, but it's meant to provide that cash flow to get through this period where in many cases, businesses have zero revenue. So it's a very, very large bill. There's an awful lot in it. And again, my hope is it will bridge us through this really, really severe, but hopefully brief economic downturn so that we can come out the other side and be back to a strong economy again. Do you anticipate that additional aid will be needed? Yeah, I think so. Uh, there's, for instance, the small business lending program that I described a moment ago is already fully consumed. The $350 billion we allocated for that is already gone and not all small businesses have yet had the opportunity to apply for that. So uh, I think we need to increase that amount. Uh, Republicans in the Senate have been trying to get our Democratic colleagues to agree to just increase that because that's the only category in this giant bill that has actually run out of money. Um, so we're getting some resistance from our Democratic colleagues who want to add all kinds of other uh, unrelated provisions. But I, but I hope we'll be able to get this resolved because small businesses need to know they're going to be able to access this money. How would you rate the president's handling of the pandemic? You know, I think we all struggled at first to understand the nature of this. There was inaccurate information coming out of China and supported by the World Health Organization. And so it was a little bit hard initially to really wrap our arms around that. But I think since then, the administration has really found its footing. I think Mike Pence has done a terrific job in coordinating all the agencies of government and the different branches of government. I think we've had terrific healthcare experts like Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks who've been explaining the nature of this pandemic and the implications and how it's changed over time. There's been a tremendous, you know, the president was entirely supportive of this unprecedented $2 trillion plus legislation that was designed to, as I say, get us through this period. So um, look, we've never been through this before. There was no playbook. There was no roadmap. We have had to figure it out as we go along, but I think the response of the federal government, including the administration, has generally been quite good. Nearly half of Pennsylvania's coronavirus-related deaths have occurred in long-term care facilities. What additional safeguards would you like to see take place to protect both residents as well as staff? Well, there's no question that's a very vulnerable population, the elderly, people in nursing homes, people in long-term care. And so we need to be as as really as rigorous as we can possibly be. When I, when I talk about the process of reopening the economy, 
I'm not talking about going back to business as usual and certainly not in a place where we know we have very, very vulnerable populations. So these places need to remain on a lockdown. We need to do everything we can to prioritize protective equipment for their staffs. We need to make sure, you know, we're making some tremendous progress on medicines that allow us to deal with uh, people who have this uh, virus. You know, when it first first came out, really the only course was to go home and drink fluids and hope to get better. And if you didn't, then maybe you were on your way to getting a ventilator, which is, is very, very unfortunately limited range of ways to treat this. Now we increasingly have medicines that are showing real promise. Those medicines need to be available at our nursing homes, at our long-term care facilities. So it, that, that certainly has to continue to be a focus for us. On a broader scope, how does the occurrence of the pandemic change what your legislative priorities are moving forward? Well, you know, it's, all, it's been all about this pandemic, right? That's been the uh, all-consuming, as it should be. And so that will remain the case. Uh, my, my, our questions are going to be, you know, what were the unintended consequences of, of what we did and what happened and what we didn't do? How do we fix whatever needs to be fixed? Are there programs like the Small Business Lending Program that need to be increased? And very importantly, how do we provide the guidelines that allow us to get back to work? The government and government spending can never be a substitute for a productive economy. In fact, the government depends entirely on a productive economy. So we've got to get back to that point as soon as we safely can. And finally, on a personal note, a few weeks ago, you placed yourself on quarantine. Can you just talk briefly about what the circumstances were and what that experience was like for you? Yeah, sure. For the last couple of weeks while I was in Washington, when we were working on this legislation, I was one of the lead negotiators on a very large section of this legislation. And that had me in meetings with a dozen or more people sitting around a small conference room and conference room table in a, in a room without windows for many, many hours. We were working 18-hour days. And so I never had any symptoms of anything, but it occurred to me that this is the kind of environment in which transmissions occur. So when I got home, I just decided to hole up in the basement, and that's where I spent two weeks, separated from my family and everyone else, just to make sure that in the small chance that I had the virus, I wanted to make sure I wasn't passing it on to anyone else. So the, the two-week recommended quarantine period expired. Um, I still have had no symptoms whatsoever. So now um, I'm at home working from my home office. My family is here, and we're all fine. Thanks for asking. Well, we're glad you're doing well. U.S. Senator Pat Tooney, thank you for speaking with us today. Thanks for having me.